in the next few minutes and continue, I guess, on on Wednesday. Monday there's no class, so we can see each other Wednesday. Um, um, is okay if you if you're arguing that you don't have to be perfect, if you if you don't you don't have to be exactly 4.5. How close do you have to be? What about 4.7? What about 4.8? That's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna discuss. But for, the first thing is to realize, as we're trying to do right now, that you don't have to expect exactly 4.5 here before you believe the zero value is right. If it's close to 4.5, again, why close? Because the reality is, that even in a perfectly good table, it's a perfectly good table. Our table is our table is perfectly good i.e. mu equals 4.5. In other words, the numbers that you're grabbing out of the back of the book or out of Excel really do have a 4.5. So if you had the answer you should be giving in that case is, I believe the table is good. The A0 guy is right. The table is good. Random number table is OK. This one is saying a random number table is not OK. So between the two of them, if you've got a 4.6, which is about a three, you hardly even get that close. Most of the time you get even worse than that. So you're saying, okay, 4.6 is close enough. So did I convince you also that 4.6 is close enough in algebra? Did I convince you? Okay, now the only point, if I convince you about a 4.6, what about a 4.4? Well, of course, 4.4 is equal to one's a tenth of a point above, one's a tenth of a point below. They're both equally close. So you've got to, to, be, to be consistent, you'd have to say, again, I believe the A0. If I ask the class to vote, Everybody who's consistent should say, I believe the A0. What about a 4.7? Again, 4.7 is pretty close to 4.5 from one point of view. A little more professional way of looking at it, but 4.7, most of these averages, which are typical examples of five numbers coming from a good table, are even worse than 4.7. They're 4.8 or 6.0 or 3.6. That's much further than 4. So 4.7, relatively speaking, is about as good as you're going to get. So again, the answer should be, I accept the A0. What about 4.8? I'm saying so you want to answer a question? Or? No, I was, I was going to say, but how about if, like, you get just one 4.8 and all the other ones are like nine? So you still need that confidence interval, don't you? Like but first, bringing up confidence interval is not incorrect. In fact, the chapter eight and chapter nine are flip sides of each other, so you can go from one to the other. Let's try to ignore confidence intervals right now. It makes it, so and you're not wrong about it. Secondly. You have to, in real life, you just do it one time. You don't do it five times. You take your sample, you get your average, you make your decision. 4.8, I accept so the only, zero, end the story, close the book, you move on to some other problem. You could only do it if you set a boundary then. So that's where we're leading. So okay, that's, where, that's, where we're leading up, that's where we're leading up to. In fact, that's gonna, be your, that's gonna be your main homework for, I guess, next time. So first, let's take it by a show of votes. If you got 4.8, how many people will vote? That's still, relatively speaking, based on your experience and your intuition and your common sense without any formulas. 4.8 will still be pretty close to 4.5 when you vote for the A0. Please show up by a show of hands. How many people feel that 4.8 is a little bit unusual? Most of the time I get 4.4s and 4.5s and 4.6s. So 4.8 might indicate there's something screwy with this table. How many people vote for the H1? If the average turned out to be 4.8, how many people would vote for the H1? So either I convinced you or I scared you off, so I don't know. All right, so now that the question, everybody who voted voted for the, for the, for the, for the 4.8 is for the A0. Okay, so this is for the A0. Let's take, I can do 5.0, 5.4, 5.5, 6.5, 7.0. Let's go right away to an extreme number like 8.8. Okay, if your average was 8.8, in other words, let's think, think what this means. Somebody gave you a brand new table. You put your finger down, you grab five numbers, you calculated the average. The average came out to 8.8. Now you have to make a decision. Either I, that number is, proves the table is a good table, or it proves the table is a bad table. Now, is it possible to have a perfectly good table and to spin the spinner or pick five numbers like a like eight, nine, 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 eight, and get an average like eight point eight. Is that possible? Yeah, it's one in a million, but it's possible. One in a hundred thousand is possible. So eight point eight could theoretically, if somebody can argue rationally that eight point eight really is accepting a zero, but it's really pushing it too much. Eight point eight is so rare, the highest you probably ever get is like seven point two or seven point four. You hardly get beyond that. So eight point eight is sort of off the chart, so to speak, even though it's theoretically possible. If you get a 9.8, that's possible. You can't get a 9.8. You can get an 8.8. So the question is, how many people would vote for the A0 with an 8.8, or how many people would vote for the H1? That's the question we have to almost end up with. Anybody vote for the A0 for the, for the 8.8 still? 4.8, everybody voted for the A0. 5.0, a lot of you will still probably vote for the A0. 5.5, maybe get some people changing their vote. 8.8, everybody changes their vote. So everybody says this is the H1. So at what point would you change your vote? Now some of you might remember this from last term, but try to 
right back to memory and start from scratch because it's better to learn from scratch. At what point would you change your vote? Now, how would you make that decision? Well, there are two ways. If you know the formula from stack one, you can plug it in and come up with an answer, which I don't want you to do. I'm pointing to teach stuff from scratch like you've never seen it before. The other way is to go to your spinner assignment and tell yourself like this. These are my numbers I'm getting typically. So if I get an answer which is sort of typical, that means it proves the A0 is right. So you figure out which, which was in what boundary. Now, that, by the way, you know, we're going to talk about one number, but you also got to talk a number on the low side as well, which I'll explain in a second. But one way of coming up with the right answer is by using sort of a practical approach, is by going to your typical spinner and saying you have 200 of these, right? This is the 200 times this term. You have 200 of these. So look at like where the bulk of those numbers are found. And that should really be like a, a point where, you know, if you get beyond that, outside that boundary, that means there's something really weird going on. And that proves that the H1 is right, or at least there's evidence that it's right. It doesn't prove anything. But. Okay, so the question is, so having said that, I'm sort of thinking, should I ask somebody to give me their volunteer and answer? Because that might influence other people. Maybe not. I don't want anybody to give me their personal answer. Your job for homework for next time, and maybe this time I will stop collecting homeworks or checking them. Is to do spinner assignment besides catching up. We're up to part number 14 now, 15. No, okay. Uh, we're talking about 16. I maybe I skipped. I, I forgot to talk about 15. If you can't, if you don't know what to do for 15, just wait until it comes to class next time. Because I don't have time to do it now. But we do have time to talk about 16 and 17. 16 and 17. So 16 is to come up with a, a boundary. Now, so let's say for argument's sake, I'm not going to say. Let's say somebody says my boundary is 5.5. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad answer. Let's say my boundary, anything bigger than 5.5 means I'm going to accept the H1. And anything lower than 5.5, like 5.4, 5.3, 4.8, I'm going to accept the A0. That's somewhat reasonable, but that's, that's a boundary. You know, step two, step three. Huh? What happens? Um, so when you pick, that means I'm willing to give how much leeway? From 4.5 up to 5.5, I'm willing to say that's my boundary for accepting the A0. You just sit down, you're waiting for the next class, right? Have a chip. Uh, so what about, that means you're willing to give a pointed leeway on the high side, shouldn't you give a pointed leeway on the low side? The answer is yes. So what's the opposite of 5.5? 3.5, because it's one point below 4, one point above 4.5, one point below. So in other words, it's got to be, when you give me one answer, implicitly there's really a pair of numbers in the background, because you've got to give me a pair of numbers. So in between, in between 3.5 and 5.5, I'm going to accept the A0. Okay, don't necessarily copy this pair of numbers to, uh, to the homework, but I mean, that's a, that, that is one possible answer. So the homework is to, first of all, come up with that pair of numbers. That's number 16. And number, I'm sorry, number 15, 16. And number 17 is to give me the reason why you picked that pair of numbers. I really want to see a reason. Let's say I picked it out of the, top, out of the, out of the air, or I copied it off the board. Give me a reason why you picked a pair of numbers. And the reason, folks, I'll give you the answer to the reason as well, the reason is because of your earlier part of the spinner assignment. By going down your pair of numbers, the, the actual numbers you got from taking numbers from a perfectly good table, that would be the foundation of how to pick the final pair of numbers. Now in class on Monday, Wednesday, we're going to look at these pair of numbers and then critique them. Well, this pair of numbers is right for such and such a reason. This is wrong for such and such a reason. And eventually, we'll come to a formula that will give us the whole answer in 30 seconds as opposed to 30 minutes. 